Hey everyone, today is October 2nd, 2017, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 60. We're going to break down all the new Amazon devices, flying taxis, using video games to help you focus, and how your smartphone can help prevent a pandemic. All aboard the Human Factors rocket ship, because the show starts right now. Let's do it. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnstorf. Oh, all aboard that Human Factors Cast rocket ship. What's going on, everybody? Man, it's like we got here in an hour or less. <laughs> And that, my it friend, took no time at all, and here we are, <laughs> another wonderful morning, Monday evening. Evening, God, evening. It's evening, Blake. What are you doing over there? I, I don't know. It's <laughs> been a long day. Nick, how are you, my man? Oh man, I am not feeling too well. I am a little sick this week. Um, some of our listeners know that I was on travel last week. I uh, I'm feeling a little under the weather, so if my voice is kind of coming in and out throughout the show. Kind of bear with me. At least I'm here. I'm talking human factors with you, and uh, you know it's it's gonna be a it's gonna be a thing. Um, I before we get into everything here, I I just gotta mention the whole Las Vegas thing. You know, I saw this when I woke up this morning, and my heart's really heavy for all of our listeners and uh, just anyone who's been, you know, involved in this in, in this Vegas shooting. Like I, I I can't believe that you know we're in a world where this kind of stuff happens but to all of you out there please be safe and and uh you know check in with your loved ones and let them know you're safe and we hope you're all okay i mean i i I don't know what else to say it's just i i'm speechless both my cousin and a friend of mine were there and uh you know it's it's just hard to to hear about something like that so please be safe it's definitely horrific stuff and love to all you guys any listeners and non-listeners who may not even hear this that's uh it seriously is saddening and definitely heavy hearts today for everybody yeah but we are here to talk about human factors let's lighten up the mood a little bit um i i got some exciting news blake so longtime listeners of the show know uh billy hall used to be on 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 the show and he had to drop out because of some some personal stuff and one of those personal things was that he got married he actually got married over the weekend so i just wanted to shout out to him congratulations to him and his beautiful wife um i hope they live happily ever after and uh that's exciting stuff oh yeah congrats to billy i didn't actually know it was this weekend or i would have said something to him but that's (laughs) awesome love to hear it he didn't invite you on purpose because he was mad you replaced him i'm just kidding (laughs) (laughs) that's awful i'm kidding i'm kidding no there's no hard feelings here um what's going on with you blake man not a whole lot so i remember last week part of one of the stories that we broke down was the ios update for right ios update 11 for apple phones right sure well Shortly after that, later in the week, the OS update came out for the actual Mac. I'm pretty sure it's called High Sierra. And I was honestly very skeptical about downloading it because of all the strangeness that occurred. Like just even though a lot of it was aesthetic, still just a lot of kind of what felt like a little bit of sloppy design from Apple on iOS. I was worried about what's going to happen on a major update from like for my main one of my main laptops that I use for design and for development right now. Hey Blake, 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 uh, Blake. Be careful what you say next, man. We got people from Apple who listen to the show. Oh yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Cuz this this was awesome. I was super excited about the update and there was like little to no like I had no idea things had changed only in a positive way. Believe it or not, my machine started running a whole bunch better, which I have not totally figured out why that is, whether it's me replacing the iOS or replacing the OS or making changes specifically uh, to some of my development environment things to make my computer run a little better. But, you know, I was really impressed with it because normally, you know, software updates, if you're a, especially if you're a Microsoft user, they can take a long time. It can take some time out of your day. And they um, can even interrupt the middle of your podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. There, that's that, too. It'll, uh, it'll ruin your podcast in the middle of the night. Oh, God. 
Um, but no, I, I don't know. There was a lot of talk. It felt like all over Twitter and just the internet in general that maybe Apple had lost its way through design. And I just kind of wanted to take our platform to say that I definitely don't think that's the case. Uh, because even though we saw some, some, some what I consider small, uh, just design, design aesthetic problems with I, the iOS update that have been talked about and will be updated. Um, I thought that the major update for the actual laptop systems and also mini Macs stuff like that was great and improved, uh, it just improved my overall day by doing it. So oh. just a small little show there. Um, well, that sounds like an endorsement. I've just been Apple. kind of enjoying life. <laughs> um, hey, so uh, that's great. I love I love that you're enjoying your Apple uh, iOS stuff. But man, I gotta I gotta tell you, I experienced um, my own sort of operating system that was unique to Delta Airlines, and uh, I, so I went on travel last week. Um, and just to say, I'm amazed that we can even organized flights they're like a logistical nightmare if you like uh, props out to you atc people because that is just nuts that that can even happen but yeah, have, like that many people in the air that many aircraft that it's just it seems like it's not even a possible thing to do right i mean I, like over three or four different airports like just the craziness that happens like how do you uh, I, I want to talk to one of you people because that, that is insane. I don't even know how it's possible. Anyway, so I was I was uh, playing there. Have you been on one of these flights with one of these in, in-flight uh, entertainment systems where you can choose your own movie or whatever? Oh, yeah. I had an amazing experience with uh, Virgin Atlantic when I was doing some of my overseas flights with one, to be honest. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I had not been on one of these flights um, in a while. And uh, I was I was really impressed with the amount of entertainment available. I mean, you could um, all all it requires is you to just plug in a headphone jack and you can watch whatever you want. And I was like, okay, what's the catch? What's where's the price? You know, it was all free, and I I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah, and I totally get that, right? Because they kind of like food nickel and dime on the airplane. It's expensive to travel, even. Uh, yeah. So for having that like added free entertainment is always fun. Oh yeah, I I was afraid they would nickel and dime me, but uh, you know they are no Spirit Airlines, I guess. So there's that. <laughs> Most definitely, yeah. Hey, I gracious. I see here you have J.J. Abrams' book. Oh yeah, I totally forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the notes. Uh, are you not looking at the notes? <laughs> I'm like I'm a step down. I don't know why because I remember what I put in here. But yeah, okay. So I was in believe it or not, the Amazon bookstore at uh, UTC here in La- uh, out here in La Jolla the other night. The physical bookstore. The physical yeah, Amazon the, bookstore. Yeah, the physical Amazon bookstore where like, if you swipe your card and you're a Prime member and that's the card you use, you get the Prime discount in the shoppy. Nice. But anyway, so I saw this book and it said that it was by J.J. Abrams. And Is this I'm his big, mystery box it, one? Uh no, that's that's the uh that Theory Eleven and Bad Robot combo of uh cards. Oh okay. Yeah, but this was this was a very I don't know interesting take on like an experience with a physical product. So they had one that had been opened up for people like to look at and use or look at and like open up and all this stuff, and it was really cool because it's like uh, it's just a story by him and another writer. It's their like debut into actual writing a book like outside of a screenplay. Um, and of course, it's it's very like sci fi based um, and about like these kids that find a book in a library um, and then they they go on to like, I don't know, it something go through some kind of like uh, supernatural transformation that's all because of this book. But anyway, the physical experience of the book was it feels like and looks exactly like an old school library book, like with the sticker that's on the little on the spine of the book that's got like the I think it's like the ISN number or the Dewey Decimal System numbers that you would use to find it in the library. Sure, sure. It's like they're all like a very old gray worn kind of like canvas. Uh, I don't know. It was just a really interesting just physical product experience. I just thought it was super interesting to see that, see actually written a physical book and taken this filmmaking and trying to really include that in the experience of reading a book. Yeah, uh, so I have to keep reminding myself that this is not a Star Wars podcast, but you know uh, who's directing episode nine now, right? <laughs> no. 
Yeah, it's it's JJ. What up? Yeah. So, cool. so uh, you have that to look forward to. Um, okay. So really quick before we jump into the news stories, I have a couple more things to say. Uh, first off, thank you to all of our uh, listeners who joined us in Slack. So that's Ali, Brian, and Andreas. Uh, if you want to do that, we we elevated uh, thanks to some. Excellent feedback from our people in our Slack channel. We elevated our link to now it's on our SoundCloud, it's on our website, and it'll be in the link. <clears throat> the link will be in the description of this show as well. So please join us there. We're trying to get the discussion going. Uh, we have a channel for the weekly stories. We have a channel for our for our episodes, and it's just a place where you can come hang out, talk human factors. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the other thing I want to mention: HFES is next week. I, in the show notes, I say HFES next week. Excitement. I'm excited. Uh, I talked to one of our listeners actually just before the show. Shout out to Logan for reaching out to us and uh, interviewing us for his class project. Thank you for doing that. That We always love from hearing from you guys. And if you're going to be at HFES, uh, I want to hear from you. I'll be there. So please feel free. Uh, approach me. Talk to me. Love to hear from you guys. Uh, we'll catch up and talk some human factors. It'll be great fun. Um, let's see. Do I have any other things in here? No. All right. You ready for some Human Factors news, Blake? Oh, you know I'm ready. All right, let's do it. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. We got a wide variety of topics this week. Got what? Amazon devices, video games, transportation, smartphones, rockets. It's all over the place this week. All right, Blake, what's up first? First up, let's do some rockets, man. So last week during a presentation at the International Astronautical Congress in Australia, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Leon Musk. Oh, Leon <laughs> Musk. Musk? He changed his name. Oh, man, yeah. There's dyslexia kicking in. All right. Elon Musk announced his plan to use a fleet of reusable rockets to move people between any two cities on Earth in just under an hour. He showed a short video detailing how this might work with passengers strolling into a rocket, which blasts off hitting around 17,000 miles per hour in suborbital space, then re-entering the atmosphere for a vertical landing. Just think of it. You can get to London and Dubai in 29 minutes, New York to Paris in 30. You know, you get the idea, but good God, this sounds crazy. Just getting in a rocket to go somewhere on Earth, not to, not literally to the moon. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I saw this, my first thought was, oh, that's awesome. And my second thought was, how in the hell is this going to work? Yeah, and there, there's definitely, a, if any of our listeners read the article or are pulling it up now, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of naysaying in the article about how this is going to pan out. Um, and what I found that was really interesting, Nick, is that a lot of companies are actually trying to attempt something similar to this, except for they're straying away from the idea of using rockets and just looking to use specially designed aircraft that can travel at high speeds and at extreme altitudes to give you the same kind of time um, luxury that this rocket idea would. Right. I think, yeah, he's just he's just uh, touting that rocket for sure. I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking up what's the G forces on. Um, so what am I what am I one of the first thoughts I had was, wow, what is the G force require or what is the G forces that the people inside this thing will experience going up, right? Because on an airplane, it's fairly low. I mean, like it's got to be what? 1.5 during takeoff at most, right? I don't even think it's that. I think it's it's probably got to be less. But, you know, on, on a rocket, something like this, you're looking at G-forces of, what does the article say? It's uh, it's up there. It's it's like, you, it's crushing. You definitely not get any work done on the aircraft with them G-forces no. messing with you. No, not at all. So you have that to get over, right? You like, uh, let's see here. What else you got? You got the uh, weightlessness, right? If you're up in, in suborbital space, you will have to be strapped in and you won't be able to really use any laptops or handheld devices for fear of safety, right? Because if something flies out of your hand, well, you can't necessarily get to it before you know, the rocket starts to re-enter and then gravity takes over again, that, that handheld device, your cell phone can hit somebody in the face. So yeah, I don't really see any, uh, in-flight service or being able to move about the cabin in this rocket for sure. You mean I don't get my peanuts? I don't get my honey roasted peanuts. 
Oh, uh, I'm thinking not, but the good thing is it's a 30 minute flight, so it's not a big deal. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's see here. What else do they have in this article that is? So th- here's a couple that I thought were really big ones. So. If you guys remember to a couple of years ago, I mean, you'd have to dig back or have paid attention to SpaceX for a long time, but they had hard a hard time figuring out their rocket takeoff and landings. Like they had rockets that didn't work or they had malfunctions. And, and think about like the fact you're going to have to make rocket tech as safe as possible to nearly getting 100% of the launches and uh, re-entries perfect. Because that's the only that's going to be a big barrier to entry for people wanting to get on these. Is oh, uh, this is a newer technology where we're putting people for mass travel on. How's this going to work? And also, there's the in, the environmental impact there too. Because if you think if you think millions of dollars are being poured into the atmosphere by jets, think about a rocket that's uh, propelling at you know seventeen thousand miles per hour. It's going to be a lot more gas in the atmosphere. Yeah, and okay, so. One other problem I have with this is uh, we uh, we talked briefly in our little banter about the logistics of being able to take an airplane and take multiple aircraft and line them up and fly that many people through the sky. How like the logistics of something like this are just crazy, right? So you um, you could potentially have a lot more going up and down, but there's a lot more room for error the more closer they are. So you have to do the whole analysis of how far apart can we have them? And then uh, how do you refuel these things in between? And how do you get people on them and off them safely? You know, there's all these logistical things that you have to figure out with this as well. Do you put them on a tube and then put the tube on the rocket and then the rocket shoots off and then the tube comes off when you land. And like, I, I really appreciate that Mr. Musk Mr. Elon Musk, our golden boy. I mean, we bring him up every other week, but I mean, you know, I really appreciate that he's really thinking outside the box here with this transportation, right? And yeah, I don't think this idea is really going to go anywhere. I think the the supersonic uh, low orbit planes have more merit than this does just because we have the infrastructure already built for that. Um, but it's it brings this sort of interesting... Uh, conversation piece right it's what if we thought outside the box uh for transportation human factors and and what kind of concerns would we have to deal with if we did have something like this yeah and you know nick i think the biggest barrier here like because honestly i believe that elon musk if he has this idea that he could figure out how to use rockets for safe air travel that he'd be able to do it i think the bigger barrier to entry is the integration into the into the nas or the uh, national aerospace system because i mean if even if we look at like development of faa regulations for something that's now ubiquitous uavs i mean there's you can buy your own drone now but there's so many like new regulations that have to go into that from developing new classes of airspace to protocols that ATCs go through. And now we're talking about a rocket that travels so much faster than a lot of aircraft, any aircraft out there. And there's going to be debris coming off the aircraft. So now the classes of airspace have to be cleared for that. I feel like it's just, it's a rework of the entire way the national airspace system would work. So I feel like, you I feel like you're you're right and so is the article the the smarter play here because of the infrastructure we have is these supersonic jets but again uh, I don't know I think a lot of people thought that electric cars wouldn't sell that SpaceX wouldn't work um, and he's continuously through his like his leadership and engineering skills and his teams proved the proved the world wrong so I don't I don't really know this is a a conundrum but also it's great to see him like again being the innovator pushing the envelope yeah and i mean yeah like like you said who who knows where this idea will go he is pushing the envelope with this and with his tube idea and uh the hyperloop another example like he is he is really trying to think outside the box to solve these problems and that's great and you know if we can If we, as human factors practitioners, can at least pass along this knowledge and maybe someone who's listening can actually have an idea that plays off this idea, then even better. Uh, You know, that's that's what that's what it's all about is uh, trying to take ideas and just make them better and and seeing how we can integrate humans 
uh, into this whole process and, and uh, develop the most uh, easy system to use for transportation. I think that's that's the goal, right? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, we're just trying to make it easier for people to get from point A to point B with as little hassle and as safely as possible. Now, that's fine. But what about the people in the houses near these airports? Oh, man. If you if you thought the noise problem was bad before. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, how bad is it going to be now? I tell you that much. Jeez, I can't imagine. It would be somewhere in between really awesome to hear rockets launching and you knew what they were. And really annoying that I just got woke up by another rocket. Oh, I know. Uh, red eye, red eye rockets. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! Oh, God. It's just a whole. Uh, but the other thing too is this is all projected to be taking off uh, to and from the ocean, so right. maybe that skirts that just a little bit. Yeah, I guess. But then you have the whole problem of uh, you're going to need Elon Musk's tubes to even get you to the ocean quickly. Uh, because that could that could out- add so much time to your trip if you have to drive out to the ocean first to get there or drive to the middle of nowhere to disrupt, you know, uh, no one. So there's there's a bunch of logistical nightmare stuff that that's going on with this. But I mean, I want to know what our listeners think. Do you think this is a, a viable idea? Do you think uh, do you think we're being too harsh on little poor Elon here? He's not little poor. He's 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 doing quite well for himself, I think, with uh, Tesla and all that. So. <laughs> Yeah, Elon is definitely the man about town, so I don't think he's he's too worried. It'll be interesting to see how this pans out, though. Yeah, for sure. All right, uh, le- do you have anything else to add on this one, or should we move on to the next story here? Let's keep kicking it, man. Let's keep kicking it. All right. So this one takes a little bit of a different term into the world of healthcare. So global health experts don't worry about if a major infectious disease outcur- outbreak will occur. For them, it's just a matter of when it will. So a daunting barrier in this ongoing fight with infectious diseases is the ability to detect them in the environment before an outbreak actually begins. A team at Purdue University has actually developed an app called PathViz, which is a smartphone smartphone-based platform designed to enable anyone to rapidly measure the level of a pathogen in an area and report it back to health authorities with real-time data of when and where that pathogen was detected. The team is also soon hoping to take their prototype to Haiti in an effort to to help out the Emerging Pathogens Institute testing the app's ability to detect cholera bacterium in the water. Man, I cannot express how much I'm really enjoying just the advances in healthcare and the combinations of smartphone technology. I just think it's great. Yeah, I I agree. So uh, I remember back when smartphones just became a thing, they used to say there's an app for that. And there would be jokes about, um, you know, what if I just want something delivered? There's an app for that. Well, now there is. What if I just want my health to be solved or, or you know, what if I want my <laughs> to be healthy? Well, there's an app for that. And now there is. And I I love that we're going in this direction. And th- the whole advertising premise behind that there's an app for that campaign was that it should be easy. It should be easy to do these things. And this is the epitome of easy. If you can test for something like an infectious disease like just with an app and your smartphone well first off you have to have a smartphone to do it but if you get over that hurdle smartphones are fairly ubiquitous and it's a tool that you could potentially bring to a third world country right so the fact that these things are becoming more ubiquitous and that they're becoming so much easier is gonna like revolutionize healthcare i think right Oh, most definitely. And I, I'm glad that the guys at Purdue, guys and gals, excuse me, at Purdue had the foresight to think like, OK, when we go through this process, typically for testing for infectious diseases in let's say like water population, all you need is a microscope and a camera and then something to actually run an algorithm. And then the thought that, wait, we basically carry a pretty powerful computer in our pocket with a camera at all times, almost everybody. Uh, So like that being the inspiration for how the app was put together is just it's awesome. And I'm glad that people have foresight to think about problems like Elon Musk and like these guys at Purdue. Think about how you can make the world better by using the technology that we have. Right. So you want to break down how this thing works? 
All right. So basically how the app works is a user would take a sample of liquid and say potentially like cam- contaminated water and they put it into a small microfluidic chip that attaches to the smartphone. And if a specific type of bacterium like cholera is detected, a chemical reaction on the chip will actually copy that DNA over and over, producing many strands of DNA that increase the viscosity of the solution. And basically what the app does is it detects in this liquid, is there or is there not, uh, basically like a binary yes or no, a bacterium in this particular liquid. So they also shoot a short video with their smartphone of this particular sample from the chip uh, using just your normal camera equipped with a small microscope addition. So it's a, and then an accompanying app actually processes and analyzes the video for you, looking for these specific changes in motion of the liquid that they use as flags for contamination. So how long do these ha- video samples have to be? Did the article say? Uh, I don't think they did. It says short, so I'm assuming, I don't know, I would assume at least 30 to 60 seconds. Because uh, I guess it's looking at specifically the movement of this liquid. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, well, it's looking for the reproduction of these of this DNA, right? Yes, exactly. And that's like signaled by something they're calling, I'm probably going to say this wrong, Brownian motion of the liquid. And I guess that's indicative of there are these dna changes going on right right man this is just so impressive to me like the fact (laughs) there's an app for that there's an app for your health now and the fact that there's an app for testing whether or not you have an infectious bacteria that is uh, i love i love technology and i love the way it's going and how can we make this easier for people well i don't know where to go from here right the only thing that could make it easier potentially is if you uh you know um what what do you use for this is this is this uh saliva or is this uh you blood? know it says in this particular case for cholera cuz usually it's infecting a water supply it's just a liquid sample oh. that would be like contaminated water um they do talk about in the end of the article the future of using this kind of tech to actually also identify malaria and things like hiv in patient blood so that's like a future capability for the app um, but right now, it's, I think it's just limited to a specific liquid, in this case, water. Man, that's that's really impressive. I am I am very impressed with this thing. With yeah, this I mean, it's 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 kind of intense because like you're adding a microchip and a th- and like an extra piece to I guess your camera on your phone. But, but the fact honestly, that this is doing it in like 30 minutes versus what takes five days. That's such a giant time gap that you're getting. Uh, that that's going to allow you to, you know, like make changes in the environment, warn people quicker. It's, I don't know. I don't think it could get any better than that. And especially it's, it's especially relevant now in this, you know, in the last couple of weeks where you have all this, um, humanitarian and disaster, disaster relief, you know, all this stuff that's happening in, uh, with all the hurricanes going on, people are going to need an easy way to test stuff. And, this this is going to be this is this would be a great way to test for clean water you know if 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 uh if it could test for a variety of things instead of just this specific strain right it could it could potentially lead to being able to identify whether or not it's clean water or um i i don't know i can i can think of a, a bunch of different applications of this but but that's the one that comes to my mind right now yeah, and then the, also we've got like the added benefit of it being part of our smart app, or a smartphone, so you're able to use some of that geolocation data for good. So in this case, transmitting where you are, and if there is specific uh, bacterium in a specific location that you're at, it can pinpoint it and maybe even be connected to health officials to efficiently target where resources need to go to kind of treat the specific area or the specific bacterium. I mean, this is just, uh, I don't know, a serious rethinking of how we diagnose medicine using smartphone technology. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all right. Do you have any other thoughts on this one before we move on? Oh, uh, no, I just think it's only going to get even more, uh, even more like, or sorry, easier for this to happen. Cause I mean, this is talking about like now using chips and add ons to your smartphone. I bet you at some point they have a smartphone that's specifically for this or a smart device that's specifically for this. Oh yeah, I agree. I, I can't wait to see where it goes next. Um, but I do have to say, I think the building it into the smartphone kind of, 
um, enhances the ubiquity of it, right? Because almost everybody has a smartphone, at least in developed countries. Almost everybody has a smartphone. And uh, if they could condense it into a singular device that, you know, was more affordable for third world countries, that, that would be one thing. Um, but I think the ubiquity of the smartphone is uh, a, a big selling point as well. Yeah, most definitely, Nick. All right, so uh, before we move on, I just want to thank all of our friends over at IEEE, Wired, The Verge, and Engadget for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media, and we post these links as we find them. You can join us in our Slack, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, we're all over the place, and uh, we post those as we find them, so you'll, you'll be up to date for the show on Monday nights. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? Okay, so up next, we got, we're going to break down some of the interesting events from Amazon last week. So they surprised everyone with a press event that unveiled a bunch of new Echo hardware and other technologies. So the Echo speaker was overdue for an update, and after the company spun off devices with a camera and a touchscreen, we'll talk about some of those. And the event also in- introduced a ref- refresh of things like the Fire TV, as well as some new applications for their virtual assistant, Alexa. So in case you missed any of the updates last week, we're going to break them down right here on Human Factors Cast. Woo, all right, so one... <laughs> One point I want to touch on before we jump into these. We've talked a lot about Alexa on the show, and uh, it's been actually a a, uh, request to have her back on. And so all I have to say to that is stay tuned. (laughs) So um, but but the reason we we pulled this story for this week is not because of all these devices. It's uh, it, it more has to do with I wanted to talk more about, you know, what this means for the future of smart homes connected connected devices as well as some of the new interaction coming out of some of these devices so why don't we go ahead and break this stuff down so we got the new echo spot right and this is kind of like um we talked about the uh amazon video what do they call that one um it's it's kind of like that but it's a circular display uh and it's supposed to kind of take your place of your alarm clock alongside your bed and this is something i didn't know i wanted until i saw this yeah, I mean, this one seems kind of interesting, right? Because it's it's like a super smart alarm clock because they're talking about in the little blurb here about being able to make video calls directly from it. That's kind of insane. Yeah, and so one thing with this, I don't know if I'd want it on the side of my bed, but uh, I already have a sort of smart um, alarm clock that, that does the whole 20 minutes before you wake up, you know, it brings the lights from a slow red to a bright white uh, which kind of simulates a sunrise, so that way I wake up nice and easy. Um, and I, I wouldn't get that with this alarm clock, but I could hook up lights that do the same thing, right? So I may have to switch over to the Echo Spot because then I'd have Alexa in my bedroom, and that to me is so. Th- this is this is the part where I am kind of getting excited about the connected home, right? <laughs> Amazon pushed a bunch of different updates lately. So now you can play music across multiple rooms. They're adding functionality every day to create this ecosystem that talks to each other that will um, sort of change the way you interact with your house, right? You can turn lights off in another room from uh, your bedroom, or you could set a timer in one room and have it say that, like, like let's say you had to go pick something up from your bedroom while you're cooking stuff in the kitchen and you could say you set a timer for five minutes and then the timer will go off across all your devices. So no matter where you are in the house, you can run back to the kitchen and get your stuff done. Or same thing with laundry. You know, you're in the laundry room and you say, uh, my clothes will be ready in 40 minutes and then boom, you're in the living room and the timer goes up. Like there are so many different applications for having a connected environment and the the thing I wanted to talk about most with these new devices is that they are creating this ecosystem that will change the way you interact with these virtual assistants. No longer is it just a singular device that you have in your home. It's not just an Amazon Echo anymore. It's an ecosystem that you can talk to no matter where you are in your home. And it will kind of, it, it, I don't know, It's it's something foreign to me because I only have one well, I have two Amazon uh, Echo or Alexa devices. So, but it'll change over time, right? And I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a, a crazy concept at this point, right? Because the like we, we walk around with smart assistants in our pockets every day. And, you know, I've talked a bunch on, 
on the show about being hesitant to like get something like some of these Amazon products that would allow me to have like Alexa at my fingertips or order things quickly um, because I just don't like the fact that it's listening all the time. Well, I've really noticed my behavior over the last few months and I am constantly interacting with Siri on my phone to do things like we were talking about, set timers, answer questions, tell me when the laundry's done is my roast that's in the oven ready to go like it's it's almost as if this ecosystem that amazon's trying to introduce gives your home like uh, an ai personality of its own that you can almost always interact with for a multitude of different um tasks that you have be it remedial or be it like doing things like order stuff for you off the off amazon or turn your lights on and off um, and then you could interact with it potentially when you're not in the house. So now you've got like the phone connected to your house and it just creates an entire, I don't know, just different home experience. Yeah. So to, to keep, keep on this whole integrated smart home theme, they released the new Echo Plus, uh, which is something I might get because it is the same as the original, but it, it introduces uh, different um communication technology so zigbee if you're familiar with it 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 kind of acts as a smart home hub right and i have a separate smart home hub now but if i could have it built in with an alexa enabled device well sorry smart things you're out so there are um and and the advantages of having a smart home hub is that it connects on different frequencies and and everything kind of interfaces through this one hub Right. Whereas right now I have Alexa talking to my separate hub where if I can have it all built in to one. So that's that's one thing. Um, you can also do this whole uh, scripted events thing where you can say good morning, turn on the lights, uh, open a window shade. You know, you couldn't do that before. You couldn't have these scripted events. You could you'd have to give it commands one at a time. But now there's um, you can combine things now. Again, with this whole connected technology, they're connecting their Fire TVs, they're connecting into BMWs, they're connecting everywhere, and they have a whole new sort of um, interaction device as well. It's this this button. I don't I don't remember what it's called. It's the the Amazon button that they're introducing, but it effectively works as a response device for uh, games on. Alexa, so you could almost do like a Jeopardy style game where people touch their buttons and the first one to respond gets to, or the first one to tap the button gets to respond with the answer. Um, uh, they are uh, Echo Buttons. That's what they're called, just for everyone listening. Uh, and the uh, the most interesting piece of this is that they're not just tied to Alexa and games. You could almost set them to do certain things around the house, right? So if you had a scripted... Um, <clears throat> excuse me i'm sick everybody it's a monday night uh <laughs> so if you had one of these scripted events you could hook that up to a button and press the button and a series of things happens in your house at the touch of a button what kind of user interface is that that's amazing yeah it's like a one-stop shop i mean you could even feasibly have like an entire routine that runs like if you used it in replacement of a doorbell, like what it does if somebody comes to the door, how it alerts you, those type of things. And it's I, I really am digging the idea that now you can say a single a singular phrase that you can and give Alexa routines to do. But this uh this version with the button is really interesting and especially since it seems so multi purpose from playing games to actually completing tasks for you. Now Another thing I want to talk about with this is, yes, we bring Alexa up a lot on the sh on the show. Google Home is doing this a lot too. And the thing that Amazon and Google are doing is they're not necessarily selling a device. They're selling the ecosystem. And they know that the way into people's homes is not just one device. It's being able to talk to this um, digital assistant no matter where you are in your home. And by lowering the price and making it more ubiquitous they know they'll have uh domination over the competition in people's homes i just it's it's so interesting to me and you made a great point with the doorbell thing i can just see it now you hook that up your nest automatically turns on and records who's at the doorbell and your amazon video responds to it and you can see who's at the doorbell and they can see you and uh you know if the facial recognition recognizes who's at the door then you're 
your uh, smart lock unlocks and lets them in. Like there's so many things that you can do with these and it's requires a lot of setup. I won't lie. Like getting a smart home set up is one of the biggest pains in the ass I've ever had to do. And especially if you move, right? So when we moved, we had to reset up everything, right? All the lights were different and they did different functionality and the smart devices were in different areas and now no longer controlling two TVs with my smart remote. It's controlling one TV. And there's a, uh, I can just imagine the scale of this. If you were to have a whole entire ecosystem, make sure you move into a home first before you do all the setup, because it's, it's such a pain in the ass. And if they can, if they can get that nailed down, if they can get this whole setup thing figured out to where it just works, that's the biggest thing. Yeah, you know, I, I could see this moving in the direction. I mean, I, I'm going to say it's going to take a long time, but honestly, this stuff grows at such an exponential rate that I maybe it won't. But I would assume you'd start seeing maybe in the future houses built with this kind of stuff already in them so that it makes it that much easier or they reduce the amount of devices you actually need to be in this ecosystem. I think this is the first round of places like Amazon and Google really trying to get these in people's homes and see how they respond. And then eventually I think a lot, I think the majority of people will adopt them given time and like a, a showing of what they really have to offer and how it can make your life a little easier every day. I agree. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see these kind of like pre-built into house systems. I agree. Yeah. And I saw on Reddit a couple years ago, even when uh, this whole smart home thing was taken off, there were people who were commissioning work to set up a whole ecosystem for people because it was so complicated. And if they can get it to the point where they just say, Alexa, I have, you know, a nest at my door and boom, it's connected like that's and do this with it. When, you know, if you're able to give it those verbal commands, like every morning, make the, the 20 minutes before I wake up, if you could get to a casual conversation point and tell it what you want and it understands and does that, then you're in like that's 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 it oh yeah the the day they really remove a lot of the keywords or and stuff and you're just having a conversation with these different virtual assistants that's going to be a super big game changer for sure all right let's get into flying taxis i want to talk about oh this. man i thought this was just excellent so in dubai this week the authorities uh, announced that a successful concept flight of an autonomous hover taxi service had taken place. The details about the actual flight are pretty scarce as far as the route taken, and there were actually no passengers that were taken along for the ride. However, Dubai's transport authorities expect that air taxis are going to become a fundamental cornerstone of the city's public transport. So much like buses, subways, and ordinary taxis, passengers will be able to actually book an air taxi. And in this case, they're going to be able to book an air taxi through an app, and track its journey and arrival much like you can through Uber. Now, I, I'd i have to go back and listen to the actual episode, Nick, but I believe remembering you calling something like this. I think it was on our 2017 predictions episode. Yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> thinking, because this, this last bit here of it being basically like you're calling your flying car like Uber – uh, is something I, f I feel like I remember you saying, and here it is, the at least the start of it anyway. Yeah, I yeah, um, I I remember there was a conversation around that too. I, I mean, we were all kind of hesitant about stepping into one of these drone-like hover taxis and, you know, what it could mean if it just showed up at your door, you hop into this thing and it takes you to where you want to go and how that would revolutionize sort of the transportation human factors. But I mean, like, so this is where we're at right now. We actually have a, uh, a working prototype, right? That, uh, it, it actually successfully completed this concept flight. Um, does it say how long the flight was? I know they say it can, it can go across the Dubai skyline for 30 minutes, uh, at about a hundred kilometers per hour. Um, but do they say what the what the range is on this thing? No, I don't think they did. It didn't really give a lot of specifics about the actual flight itself. And I think a lot of that was to kind of just get at the fact that, OK, this is a concept, but let's get it out there and see what people respond to this. I'm just going to double check the article and see if I can get any specific 
times from it. Sure. Well, I mean, they do mention that, um, you know, they're, they're, they're planning on launching this by 2020. Yeah, which is pretty interesting because that's really not that far away. But it's in the same like paragraph above it, it also says that not to expect it soon because it's going to take a while for it to become a thing as they figure out both safety and legal aspects of the service. Um, but what was also interesting is, I, I mean, you might even see concept tests start to appear uh, in the states, I think, because there's mention that Uber is actually currently working on something very similar to this. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple companies working on VTOL, um, vertical, vertical takeoff and landing, uh, hover taxi type uh, prototypes. Yeah, so I mean, it'll be interesting to see where it goes for sure. And I think this is this is going to put some pressure on some of those other companies because this is this is the first step that uh, wow they've done it. The um the other thing with this wrong though, and it's got a lot of um separate uh sorry you cut out for a sec there what was that uh just I was I was saying that I'm kind of admiring the de- the safety design they have there uh, with a lot of with the deployment of like emergency parachutes and also like uh, it says they've got multiple independent battery systems that work in order to try and make landing safe and also I'm assuming if some fail then you've got fallback so it looks like they're going the right direction in terms of safety yeah yeah i noticed that too um did you ever find out on range did you see anything on range there no there's nothing on range it's just giving you like the time it was able to fly and then how fast i'm assuming it was just a 30 minute flight sure all right well i mean we can stay tuned for that one all right do you have any other things to talk about with this one or should we move on to uh our feel good story of the week let's move on to the feel good story of the week nick All right, let's do it. All right. So as most of you know, listeners of the show, Nick and I both like to play video games, and this is a a fun article centered around that. So some people unfairly blame video games for the proliferation of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or HDHD, ADHD, (laughs) excuse me. There we go. Third time's a charm. I know. In kids today. But the startup called NeuroPlus hopes to convince people that its brain-controlled games can actually improve ADHD, right the first time, Boom. symptoms in children. So in a pilot study, kids with ADHD showed better focus and attention after 10 weeks of playing the games while wearing their brain-sensing headset. And this is this is kind of an interesting line of research because I was just talking about this with somebody today, the benefits... Um, that have been documented at least in a research context from playing first person shooter video games and then seeing enhancements in people's attention and a span of their attentional field. So, I mean, this kind of video game research has been going around for a long time. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm kind of interested in the methods that they use to research this. So it seems like they did a control group, right? Where uh, they just did treatment, medication, therapy, that kind of thing. And then, the second group um, was uh, the treatment plus the video games, right? Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much what it is. I think uh, the second group, so they went along like treatment, taking their medication, can't really adjust that. But they also, in addition, played these Neuro Plus games uh, three times a week using like an EEG recording headset. Now, is the idea behind this that because they are c- controlling it directly, um, their brain drifts less they're 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 less hyperactive or the the hyperactive qualities uh exhibit um less because they're so focused on controlling this game yeah and i from what i got from the article a lot of it has to do specifically with these neuro plus games so as you as that sensor gets specific neural activity that's that is i'm gonna say supposedly because i haven't seen hard hard uh, papers about this but it supposedly is hitting the places in your or getting neuroactivity from places in your brain that are related to attention and focus and when you're getting a lighting up sensation of that you get effects in the video game so and in, in this case they've got like a dragon racing video game for example where as brain signal gets increased as it's related to how much you're focusing your attention and concentrating that you actually get like a speeding up effect so it's it's as if you get like kind of buffs the more you pay attention the more you focus oh okay i see so the so what of this right is like what does it do over time yeah and that's a that's a really good question because i mean 
in reality, you see a lot of these effects kind of wax and wane depending on the time they were used. Because this talks about that after 10 weeks, when they measured kids' attention uh, through different assessment of specifically attention, hyperactivity, and impact, Pulsivity, which I would love to know the actual measures they use. I think they talk a little bit about that later on in the article. But anyway, I mean, they they say there's significant improvement in scores based on these assessments. And you and I know both being having psychology backgrounds and then human factors backgrounds that there could be a large amount of variability due to individuals. However, there this is like a 30 versus 30 set of kids with a control versus uh, what was manipulated. So I mean it it is showing like some definite changes, um, but it's it's hard to say that it's all because of the video game, right? Because they're yeah. definitely still continuing treatment. It could be some interaction between the treatment and the video game for sure. I'd be curious to see what this looks like two years out. Um, they they did the ten weeks right, and they they did the better scores after ten weeks, but two years. I wonder I wonder what uh, what kind of beneficial effects because video games get you know a bad rap a lot of times for uh, being bad for a developing brain. Um, but I wonder what would happen after two years of something like this and, and to see if it would truly have any long lasting effects on learning or, or any sort of uh, ADHD uh, suppressing any ADHD symptoms. Right. Or yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting how they talk about it towards the end of the article, right? Like the, the big thing that this is supposedly doing is it's helping you improve by improving your game performance. You're focusing more and you're teaching these kids, I guess, a specific type of neurofeedback. So to focus your attention and make these signals activate more reliably. But the, the thing that I'm kind of, I have questions about anyway, is it's great that they did improvement on like these assessment tests that are specifically geared to um, measure ADHD symptoms. But I wonder if there's any kind of real effects in like in school, are they still exhibiting these same kind of uh, more focused and concentrated attention or is it just on these specific tests that they were taking? And also too, right. like what's the drop off for this? Cause even in the attentional effects research for video games, like after the 10 week period, you see a pretty sharp drop off if you don't continue it within like a two week span of time. Uh, so that would be another kind of interesting take on this particular study. Yeah, well, uh, it's always a good news when video games are in the news for a positive reason. And uh, I love this story. So uh, do you have anything else to add to this one, Blake? I don't, but I have to echo your sentiments is this is my favorite story of the week and always good to end on a positive note with the stories for sure all right let's see what came from reddit this week uh this is the part of the show where we search all over reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about so any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion amongst the community all right so let's get into this one this is from oh i'm gonna mess this up real bad help me out blake it's rebel quaternion i i like it all right, Rebel Quaternion from the User Experience subreddit writes, UX prototype feedback from every employee. They write, greetings. As a UX UI intern, I am not sure whether I should ask for and listen to every opinion in the company or just the top level people, team, <laughs> team leads and director board. I value every opinion, but now that I think about it, some people are perhaps not so knowledgeable about a problem at hand. Uh, on the other hand, we often test and listen to ordinary users who perhaps don't know as much. They actually use the product. Um, this leads me to value exactly those kind of people because no question is a stupid question. And if e.g. a person uh, from support knows more about these kind of people we're dealing with, my resolve is that they can only help with input. What are your thoughts? Okay, Blake, I want to hear I want to hear what your thoughts are on this one because I got some pretty strong opinions. Okay, this is kind of loaded for me, so I'm going to do <laughs> I think my it's loaded best for both to, of us. to answer it the way that I can. Um, so it sounds like you're an intern, and it might be uh, might be kind of hard for you. Is I'm wondering if somebody is expecting you to get prototype feedback from every employee, because um, if that's the case, there may be nothing you can do to skirt it. But if that is not the case, and you're the one making decisions, and it is your uh, project to take hold of and get opinion from the correct people. Here's how I would do it, and this is only based on my knowledge, and I'm kind of good. So I'm not really sure what your situation is, but since you're a UX UI intern, if somebody told you to do this, I totally get it. All right, you have to follow 
follow what the person above you is telling you to do, especially if you're just an intern in the company. But if you've gotten some freedom and are able to kind of determine how UX design and how development of UIs goes in your company, I would say that the best thing you can do is to um, just focus on getting feedback and iterating with your actual team. So if you're working in a smaller little development team to get you through this effort, I would iterate with them because they're the ones that are going to have the best knowledge about what you, what the goals are you guys are working for working towards. And they'll have a pretty good diverse perspective because typically these smaller teams will have interaction with your developer. Um, if you're the only UI or UX person and then anybody else that's pivotal to what you're working on. Uh, when you start taking this stuff up to the board of directors or the C-suite, you can have two things happen. I mean, they may expect you to get to that point and already be showing them a finished product. So you definitely don't want to do that going in there looking for prototype feedback. And two, they may have a conceptual understanding of the problem you're trying to solve at a much different level and operating in a different way than your actual team is. So you could have a divergence in what you're, ha what you're actually designing based off of like your CEO or your board of directors thinks is necessary versus what your actual smaller team knows to be the core problems and understands users. And I mean, I mean you make a really good point that you want to interact with users who don't really know as much about this kind of stuff because the more you're interacting and testing internally, you're going to run into biases about the product, maybe biases about your own processes that you guys have that people may or may not like. Uh, it's just overall better to keep the input localized from your team and then be using uh, general population users like you have been to try and really get some more feedback about the iterations of your UI or your entire design as a whole i don't know nick what do you have for this guy so i think okay so uh blake and i were laughing backstage about this but only because of the reason of we've been there right it's the the idea of presenting to top level people is um there, there's a point where there gets to be too many cooks in the kitchen then there's a difference between buy-in and feedback right so you want you want higher level people to buy in to your ability to solve the problem. You don't want to solicit their feedback because like you said, you are more connected to the end user. You want the end user's feedback and it's your job uh, to act kind of like a translator to take that user feedback and feed it back into the design. And it's up to the board of directors and the team leads to trust you to do that. Um, you know, that's not to say that you can't collaborate, collaboratively work on something with a team lead um, to solve a problem. But as long as they trust that you're gathering the right feedback and are, and are incorporating it in the right way, that I think is the level that you need to be looking for. Um, any more than that, and it gets to be that whole too many cooks in the kitchen uh, scenario, you know, where you have so much feedback, well, who's... You know, they are stakeholders. Are they stakeholders? And, and, you know, how does that play into your design? And do you want to appease them but make the user experience crappy be at a at a um, at a cost to that? Like there's there's so many things going on with this. I would say just try to you do you and try to keep always keep the user's best interest in mind. And, uh, you know, once just try to get that buy in from higher up, establish a trust with them. Once they know that they know what you're doing, you should be good. And I know you're an intern and it's hard to build that trust, but uh, do the best you can. And that's that's about all I have to say on that one. Yeah. And I, I want to echo Nick's sentiments there, like working with your smaller team and getting the feedback you need from users. That's definitely on you. But also what I don't think I include that Nick really made a good point about is part of your job too is to make your your board or your C-suite level people understand what you're doing and value the process. So seeing why they hired you as an intern, what they're getting out of it, and by including them kind of peripherally in, in the this is the more finished product type of sessions, that will garner this like trust that Nick's talking about. It'll make them more confident in your ability to tackle these problems with users and with your smaller team. So it's just advocating for UX in your company. For sure. All right, Blake, any other closing thoughts on this one? I think we're good. I hope we answered your question, Rebel Quarter Nyon. Quarter nice one. Know. Rebel Quarter Nyon. 
<laughs> All right, well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you thought of the stories this week. Did you like the Rockets? Did you hate them? Uh, let us know. If you guys have any suggestions for topics, you can drop those in our Slack. Or you can, uh, you know, follow us all over social media. Uh, we're on uh, Human Factors Cast on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or, like I said, our Slack. It's in the description, and it's on our SoundCloud, and it's on our website. So please hang out with us on Slack. Uh, or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com if you're shy. You can also leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HSC. That's for the non-shy people. You can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. If you don't want to support us financially, that's fine. We just ask you to uh, like, subscribe, and review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnstorff, thank you for helping me break down all these news stories this week. Where can our listeners go to find you if they want to hang out with you? Oh, for sure, Nick. It's always my pleasure to be on the show every week with you. And you guys can always find me at Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Or the Slack. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, oh, it depends. depends on rockets. One hour rocket travel. Elon Musk. I wonder if I can get Alexa in my Beamer. BMW? Yeah, yeah, you're good, man. See you at HFES! Yeah!